I love Mega Man. I've always loved Mega Man since I was a kid. There is an incredible breadth of Mega Man content from games to animations to collectible cards and the subject of today's video, comic books. Oh, you mean the Archie comic, one of the most beloved adaptations. Uh, nope. Then you must be talking about the short-lived but interesting Dreamwave comic series, right? Uh, not even close. Uh, the manga, like the slightly grittier Rockman Megamix and Gigamix series by Hitoshi Origa. I wish, but no. So, Cat and Shrew. Yes. Are you too familiar with uh, Mega Man? This is what we're reading? Mega Man? Mega Man. You've seen Mega Man, you know of the, the bright, colorful adventures in silly robot land, you're, you're mm -hmm. at least pa have a passing familiarity, both of you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I played some of them anyways. Have you heard of Novas <laughs> Aventuras de Mega Man? No, holy shit. How'd they draw a role like that? God damn. What He's the so... fuck am I looking at? <laughs> I guess. So, are we? We need to get so, demonetized. So, I'm not monetized. <laughs> we need a little context. I'm going to read a quote from MM25, the anniversary art book that is packed with comments from various people who worked on the series over the years. To be honest, I feel I owe the players an apology for this one. There was a phase when the company was basically selling Mega Man to the lowest bidder, and I really feel like this title is the worst of the worst. Now, this is actually about Super Adventure Rockman, uh, but I think it's a good confirmation that in the late 90s, Capcom was a little license-happy with the Mega Man property. Around this time, there was an anime and manga magazine in Brazil called Animax. They were owned by Magnum Publishing, who had an existing relationship with a licensing company called Character. Character represented a lot of Capcom IPs at the time, including Mega Man. As the Ruby Spears Mega Man cartoon had started airing only two years earlier, in 1994, the Animax staff pushed Magnum to get the license to create a comic book based off the property. Animax was a small publication at the time, run by editor-in-chief Sergio Peixoto. He and his business partner, José Roberto Pereira, only got Magnum to agree to this because they offered to work for free. In the time since its publication, Novas Aventuras de Mega Man has become infamous for, uh... You'll see. Because we're going to do the whole thing. All 16 issues. This absolutely insane cover depicts a pretty classic looking Mega Man alongside a pretty not classic looking roll. She is 100% naked here, this is all her skin tone. And she got those Rob Liefeld feet going on. Pereira, who's the writer here, gives a foreword that was not translated, but the important part is here, where he says, The script is like this. I took the TV show's story and threw it out, because it's so bad. Now, I'm not going to call the Ruby Spears cartoon high art or anything, Let's see how you do against Kung Fu Gutman! Yes! But it's pretty bold to put this at the start of the same comic where you include full-size posters of the Ruby Spears cartoon. The story kicks off in a desert where Roll is being chased by sand troopers. Alright, sure you should take uh, this gentleman here. <laughs> this sand trooper. I don't even know I can't fucking say that with the street. <laughs> That's one rebel who learned you can't mess with the sand troopers. These guys are obviously based on Pharaoh Man, but in the games, he's a single character. It's almost like the writer took one look at the box art for Mega Man 4 and made some assumptions. Roll falls into a pit, escaping the troops, and finding Mega Man in a scene that weirdly mirrors the opening of Mega Man Zero almost to a T, but this was years earlier. Huh. I found it. Finally. 
Mega Man. What the fuck? I don't like you just nutted. Oh, whatever. Oh <laughs> That's what all this stuff is. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Mm -hmm. What's Mega Man been doing the past 30 years? <laughs> he's, just, he's had a lot of free time. <laughs> Get your shit to- Whoa! You <laughs> me off guard. Okay, anyway. You said it so confidently, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'll do it again. Get your shit together, Roll. After waking him up, Roll explains that her injuries are easily fixable because she's a Lazarus 64 model and that the world has fallen into ruin and decay. She's only just awoken herself, and she... checked the internet for info. Exposition time. After what I assume were classic Mega Man hijinks, Dr. Wily was arrested, and the world declared a ban on all robots like Rock and Roll. Mega Man is sometimes called Rock here, it's his Japanese name by the way. Dr. Light couldn't bear to give up his children, however, and upgraded them in secret. But their upgrades didn't take effect immediately, I guess? So they had to sleep to, like, digest them? I don't know. A big Japanese company develops a new line of robots with intelligence, independence, and auto-sustainability. And they were called Neo Mavericks. Like Mavericks from Mega Man X, except there were no regular Mavericks in this story for these to be Neo? Actually, they sound just like Reploids in general. It's almost like the writer just pulled together a bunch of vague knowledge of Mega Man into a story. Well, these Neo Mavericks made an alliance with Wily for a reason that's never disclosed. Wait, shouldn't he be in jail? In any event, they went about ripping people limb from limb. Destroyed everything they saw. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh. These guys, oh my god, he's like I torn in half. What the fuck? God what damn. the fuck? This is so funny. Oh. <laughs> what the hell? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Man's burning to death. I <laughs> know. It's like a Ralph Bakshi movie. What the fuck is this? She tells him that in the 30 years since, Wily has become emperor, and their father has died. And we get our first taste of political commentary. With seemingly no motive other than justice, they decide to take this conveniently placed ship to a city to free some slaves? I guess there's slaves now. They get into an argument when Rock makes sexist jokes about her being too weak to fight, and then a weird comment about her beautiful blue eyes. As they depart, five shadowy figures watch over them in one of the few plot threads that actually goes to the end of the series. This is vaguely reminiscent of X2, but it might just be a trope. Uh, who knows? These figures are in league with Wily, who assures them that he'll turn Mega Man evil. This doesn't come up again. Issue 2 promises a meeting between Mega Man and X, which, barring time travel, should not happen. The narration describes Mega Man as half-man, half-technology, which is another diversion from the canon. You might also notice that the artist is completely different. In fact, there are three artists on display here. See, Peixoto and Pereira barely got permission to make this in the first place, and if they couldn't even ask for money themselves, how do you think they were going to pay artists? The first issue was done by Pereira's wife, in part because of nepotism, and in part because... Like, who else? The solution they eventually came up with was... Volunteer work. Yep, Animax put out a message in one issue calling artists to send in applications who wanted to work on a Mega Man comic. It had to be six pieces, two in color, two in line work, and two standalone artworks. According to Peixoto, they instantly got over 600 submissions, and he personally looked through each of them. What was their compensation? Uh, well, they got featured at the end of the magazine for portfolio purposes. Being paid in exposure is usually clowned on for being a scam, and rightfully so, but... I feel like this is an exception. I mean, it's not like the money was going to anyone else. Except maybe Magnum? 
but we don't even know if they were breaking even on this. Back on track, their mission is to, quote, find heroes that resist the terrible bioroid power. This is the first and only time the term bioroid appears. They don't explain what it means, or what its power is, or why someone would be resistant to it, or them. And I thought they were trying to free slaves? It's been one issue and the writer can't keep continuity. Roll decides that Mega Man needs a trench coat to disguise himself. Mega Man has a line about ripping out Wily's eyeballs and using them as marbles. What the f- Roll takes a jab at American comics and randomly undresses in front of him, which he is way too into. Conveniently, the ship is attacked before she can change her clothes. They've been shot down by the home defense system of Mega Man X, wearing very expressive bunny slippers. X unnecessarily creeps on a girl he's just met, and they explain the same plot to him. Roll is suddenly wearing the exact same clothes as before. I guess it wasn't so important to change. We in home Alabama. <laughs> now, to be fair to X, he doesn't know that they're siblings yet, and explains that he's the most advanced prototype in artificial intelligence. Basically what a reploid is. And he can make delicious meat and cheese croquities. Roll ponders how convenient it is that they would randomly run into each other, which is explained by a fourth wall-breaking appearance by the staff. I'm guessing this is Pereira because he's wearing an Animax shirt and he blames the editor, Peixoto. These three are probably the other contributing artists for the issue, Marcos Pinto, Daniel HDR, and Alexandra Texera. Were they dating? Why are they wearing complimenting Ranma one half shirts? Anyway, he offers to give them a place to live, but they refuse because they have an objective. X is offended by this because he's seen so many horrors, killed millions, and gotten tired of fighting. Now, this angst is actually one of the few game accurate pieces of characterization in the series. It never happens again. They argue for a bit, but X gives in when he realizes he doesn't have the patience to rebuild his house, and he wants to fuck his sister, who he now knows is his sister! Upgrade his slot? What, what, what do you- X decides to join them, donned in the classic first armor, as enemies close in around them. It, wait, what is this? An important announcement from the production team. In the next issue of this comic book, a new character created by Brazilian artists will appear. Obligatorily, she'll be a part of this comic book. At first I was against it, since this comic book's name is Mega Man, and we should be shoving an urge to go to the arcade to play Capcom products down your throat. But as there's a Brazilian writer putting words in my mouth, and naturally I'm a kind of puppet, and I do what they tell me, I want to introduce you to... Princess. Yes, the book grinds to a halt on a cliffhanger so the writer can devote the last eight pages to his original character, Princess, being given a sit-down interview. Those characters, Americans or Japanese, whatever, they were well-behaved for too long. This blabber of good against evil, of hero reaching destiny, that's all from the past. You know what I'll do in the next issue, if there is one, I'll get into this mess you call a story and put an end to those punks' fun. For decades, American characters ruled the Brazilian comic book market, coupled with the complacency of our publishers that instead of helping new talents spread their legs to the foreign material, just because it's cheaper. But this time, the Yanks made a mistake. They gave a brainless, angsty Brazilian writer the chances to let out all the rage he has against copyright licensors, against all the publishers, and against all those who helped to spay the Brazilian comic scene. I'll show those dumbasses that think Brazilians can't make comic books, and to those cretins that love Marvel slash DC, how many chips does it take to make scrap? I'm gonna get you, Mega Man. I'll get your sissy brother and your whoa. I'll I'll get those bioroids, those mavericks that think they're Willie's arrows. I'm getting 
base. I'm getting Madam Wily, and I'll show you all a real action sequence. Because I am protected by the biggest force in the world of comics. I'm above Galactus, Superman, Monica, and even Mickey. I'm protected by the story's author. And I'm indestructible. I'm ending all those metal jerks. And after I'm done, I'm going for whoever made a fool out of my master? I'll leave no stone unturned. Just you wait. I'll be back. Or not. So, uh, Monica is a reference to Monica's Gang, a classic Brazilian comic. I'm sorry, are we gonna, like, ignore the fact that she just said she's going to kill every other character in the comic? The end note sums up my thoughts exactly. What is this madness? Will Capcom allow such absurdity? Will Jose be stopped? Pretty bold of a writer to make himself the main villain of his story. Literally. Well, at least we get an explanation for that cliffhanger. After defeating the metallic beings that weren't shown because Princess interrupted the story, our heroes left for Sao Paulo. <laughs> Motive? Dunno. Didn't think about one. We'll come up with one when the time arrives. The art in this issue is mostly fine. It's pretty expressive, at least. On the way to Sao Paulo, X says that it was a beautiful place. And Roll fires back that it was polluted, ugly, full of criminals, terrible traffic, corrupt politicians, and was, ugh, the worst city in Brazil. They end up in this pseudo-philosophical debate about truth while Roll's got her titties out. They break it up, and X thinks about fucking his sister again. Roll changes again into this of all outfits. Everything is in order and operational. Wait, hold on, I'm fucking confused. Yeah. In the previous scene, <laughs> she obviously wasn't wearing a bra. Yeah, but in I this know. scene, she put it on. Seeing, I put her bras and socks. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, I didn't even see that. warrior type shit. <laughs> Cat, it's you. <laughs> oh my yes. god. Wait. Ready to put some screws into those guys? <laughs> Look, Roll, you're gorgeous in those clothes. I, I love your cleavage. But this is a battle for more capable machines. <laughs> Rock and X make sexist comments towards her, but are interrupted by an attack. Roll mans the guns, and a writer's note tells us that she uses anger as a way to vent her grief. I didn't know characterization was so easy. After winning the battle, Mega Man remarks, I'm having a flash of inspiration. If we were in peacetimes, I'd do a comic book with our adventures. It would be called Mega Man. <laughs> We would get big money with licensing. I bet they would make even an animated series for TV and sell toys of us. But that cartoon wouldn't be made by Americans, or else it'd come out nasty. Oh my god. It'd have to be done in Japan. High tech and stuff. Yeah, done in true manga style with big eyes, lots of sensuality, action. I love manga. It has lots of pretty girls. A Mega Man manga. What would that be called? <laughs> what about Manga Man? <laughs> this is just, I wonder if I turned autopilot on. Autopilot is not activated! <laughs> we should have insurance that covers plane crashes. We would get rich. Do you remember like the first issue of this when like people were getting like decapitated? Yeah. That feels like so long ago. After crashing, the group is confronted by the mayor of Sao Paulo. An evil robot. There's some bizarre political satire with tax rates and judicial corruption. And then he smashes world of fucking pieces. All that's left is a weird metal pod that looks like a xenomorph head. Suddenly, we cut to the frozen Patagonian tundra, where two mysterious characters are opening a portal to spread the word of communism to other dimensions. Fear not, Nastenka. I'll bring a warrior with great power. They'll serve us blindly. Marxism will shine on Earth again. This is a real line in an officially licensed Mega Man comic. Who emerges from this portal? None other than Princess. 
who is making good on her promise from last issue. She implies that she already knows where she is, and I'm not sure if this is a subtle reference to her being aware that she's in a story. We also get a hint that next issue will be Roll's backstory. <laughs> We go back to 1996, in a city whose name doesn't matter. The tone shifts so fast that you could break your neck. That's just a- that's a prostitute. This is an officially licensed Mega Man comic. <laughs> this is Blade Runner, what are you talking about? We delve into the story of a young girl, presumably Roll, who is kidnapped on the street and taken to a mysterious facility with lots of other young girls. I have to hand it to the artist, this stuff is pretty good. There's some interesting panel-to-panel -panel storytelling going on here with several creative layouts. It really matches the hopeless feeling that the script is suddenly trying to convey. Uh, some scenes like the room of kidnapped girls being hosed down are genuinely stomach dropping. I mean, this guy who really looks like a Nazi calls them fresh meat and roll a uh, hottie. Is that a water gun? Wait, what the fuck? He's just <laughs> hosing <laughs> them? <laughs> oh my god, oh you're kidding her clown script? What the fuck? Oh god, let's use oh. this hottie here. Not ideal, but she'll do- Oh my god, the old man is keen on some fresh meat? There will be a banquet on the dude's desk tonight. What the fuck it's is Salo, going dude. on? Is cannibal holocaust. Hey, it's fan mail time. <laughs> what the- Everything will be okay. You give me food, mister? Kinda. Oh my god. Oh my oh, god. Oh, what oh. the fuck is gonna happen? Oh, it just, uh, some bad associations going on here. SLAP! Yes, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Fucking David Bowie. <laughs> Slaps <laughs> roll. <laughs> <laughs> Roll's body is opened up, her head is removed, and parts of her are replaced with robot parts. They're gonna sell her organs to transplant clinics to fund their Cayman Islands accounts. A mysterious mustache explains how this is possible, then revealed to be Wily, who announces that these kinds of cyborgs are the future of computing. A very strapping young Dr. Light laments the experiment and informs the audience that there are many more like her working on the moon, Mars, and sun colonies. Wait, sun colonies? And isn't Roll the first one of her kind? Does that say sex slaves? Capcom presents. Light rescues Roll and takes her as his daughter, and in only a few months, humanity reaches a new level of glory. I suppose with the new cyborgs? Light then built Proto Man, Mega Man, and Rush. Uh, Rush never reappears. So, the timeline now goes something like this Roll is kidnapped and turned into a machine. Light steals her from the lab and gives her a new home, creating other robots. Mega Man was previously stated to be a half human, so I guess that's been retconned now. Two issues later, Wily creates robots to take over the world. I'm assuming he is unsuccessful, as Mega Man puts him in jail. The world outlaws the first generation of robots. The Neo Mavericks are created and work in secret with Wily to make killing machines. The Neo Mavericks take over society, and Wily is made Emperor of the World. Light puts Rock and Roll into stasis for 30 years, and at some point X is created, I guess? My neck is snapped in the other direction as the tone shifts yet again to a lighthearted story about Mega Man and X entering a race to win money for Roll's new body. Not to rag on the art style, but it's very... How to draw manga? The race is being put on by Turbo Man, who looks very funny trying to wear this regular man suit. I like this. Meanwhile, Roll's brain has been put in a washing machine. Right after the horrifying story of kidnapping and human experimentation, we get silly slapstick humor and jokes about... Neoliberalism. Not a lot happens, to be honest. Mega Man tells X to go bonk those dudes at once. Bonk! Bonk, bonk, bonk! What the fuck is up with X's legs here? 
Uh, he gets roughed up and slides into the pit for Roll to squirt all over him. The explosions actually look pretty dynamic. I like the way they're drawn. More hijinks ensue as they murder other thinking, feeling robots, and Rock starts calling X... X. Suddenly, Bass shows up. In this translation, he's been given his proper name, but in the original, he's called Slasher for some reason. Bass disappears, and the brothers realize that they're standing right in front of the finish line, while the author's note points out that they were in the pit just a moment ago. Even the author is pointing out the absurdity, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just jarring. There's a wacky exchange involving them not getting money for the race, and they end up in a phone booth searching for bodies in the yellow pages. Princess wonders what will happen next. Overall, a pretty boring issue that feels like filler. It kind of reminds me of the Heaven's Arena arc from Hunter x Hunter in that it slows the pace of the story and logically follows what the characters would want next, but instead of fleshing out the world and introducing characters and concepts for later, it goes, hey, here's base, and ends. If you were following the credits for each issue, you might have noticed that this is the first issue where Pereira is not writing. That is for a very good reason. So remember when I implied that they took a bunch of vague knowledge of Mega Man and pulled it together into a story? Well, Sergio Peixoto, the editor, who Pereira blamed for giving him too strict deadlines, uh, was too busy with Animax Magazine to actually pay close attention to the comic. Thus, he left pretty much the whole script in Pereira's care. Neither of them had played a Mega Man game, but Pereira seems to have either convinced him that he knew what he was talking about, uh, or he just never bothered to check. Either way, the topic eventually came up between them, and Peixoto learned that Pereira asked a friend who had played Mega Man games what the series was about, and then he threw all of the disparate information into a blender. Mind you, the Mega Man series at the time did not really concern itself with telling its story in a very involved way, so a lot of people just didn't realize things like the X series takes place a hundred years after the classic series, or Pharaoh Man is just one guy. These early issues read like a dream, where Random terms and imagery from the games are pulled together without context or care. Peixoto admits in a blog written years later, quote, I believed that the Mega Man story would be in good hands. I was much more innocent then. Naturally, he was kind of upset that Pereira was throwing out nonsense garbage, shoving his own characters into the plot, and he was fired. From here on out, Peixoto takes over the script and must continue on, wrestling with both Pereira's insane plot setup and the fact that he doesn't know anything about Mega Man. The trio seem to have crashed their ship, and Roll spits out laundry at them. X holds her panties with glee. For some reason, Roll only now tells them to connect her to the ship's computer. They need to go back to the place she found Rock, and apparently her ability to fix herself also applies to just fixing the entire ship. X asks her for a full body angle, and these shadowy guys make their first appearance in four issues. After finding the lab, they plug Roll into the computer, and X tells her to make her next body's butt bigger. This is getting ridiculous. Uh, this is the same comic that had this. They get an alert that they're being attacked, and Peixoto's ego appears. This is what the writer's note says to tell them that if there's no fighting, the book won't sell. They are confronted by a Jewish robot. Uh, just kidding. This is Jiramum, the Kangasero robot. Kangasero is a term that originates from the early 1800s in Brazil. It refers to a group of people in northeast Brazil who roamed the countryside as nomadic bandits in a form of rebellion against the government. Uh, basically Robin Hood type crimes where they stole from the wealthy and redistributed it to the poor. The states of the Brazilian Federation created a specialized police force to combat the Congaceros known as Volantes, 
but because the state was so despised, local Brazilians would often help the congaceros evade capture. The most famous among them was known as Lampiao, which means oil lamp, because he could shoot a rifle so fast it looked like he was waving a lamp around. I'm getting too into this, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, you should check it out. Now, I don't know why this iconic Brazilian symbol is being used as a villain. Uh, this comic already had some odd mentions of Marxism, but maybe Peixoto just wanted to throw in more Brazilian stuff. Bring it on, you, you big fruit! Okay, oh my god. <laughs> During Pride Month. Roll emerges in a new body and calls him Rapadura, which is a local food-based slur. Uh, this is getting weird. After the fight is over, Roll gives them the new objective of the comic, to find the rest of their family, which, I suppose, is more of an overarching goal than we've had yet. Wait, weren't we going to free the slaves in, uh, Anglagard City? I guess they're just gonna languish in poverty. This issue opens with two robots arguing over someone who is part of the Six. This person is Proto Man with a robot hand. I said, is that Winry Rockbill? It really Sorry, does look like her. When did this come out? Reading a the trio are looking through a database left by Dr. Light, but it's inaccessible. With nothing else, Roll is somehow able to track Base's location and he's in Oh, Patagonia! We're going back to this, finally! This is Kalinka. Yes, Kalinka, little, little girl Kalinka. And she drops this line, Could you pay attention? You've got to defend communism. Princess reveals that she's come to take over the world, massacre crowds, and eat their steaming entrails. She is made unapologetically evil. No doubt out of revenge from Peixoto to Pereira. When Kalinka tells her assistant, Nastenka, to send her back, Princess retaliates and shoots her off a ledge. Why don't you call her Kruzadit? Which is not a name or word. Kalinka tries to send her to Satan, but Princess just flies up and calls her a landless worker? What, what the fuck? Now, I've only brought up the posters once because they've mostly been from the Ruby Spears cartoon or kind of, eh, art. This is the first one that really caught my eye. It has like, a mood to it, and the composition is interesting, at least. Just as the trio arrive, Princess blasts a hole through the front door, and X recognizes her from her fourth wall-breaking introduction, I guess. Princess references HQ Mix, a Brazilian comics award, and then her ass tells a robot that she apparently brought with her to attack. There's some perfectly fine action before they slam Princess back into the portal, never to be seen again. Go get your own comic book! Peixoto is now forced to deal with the rest of Pereira's writing, Kalinka and Nastenka. We get a cutaway where Wily explains that the main characters have been taking out his enemies, despite the mayor being a uh, random run-in they had, and I thought the Kangaseros were his robots. I guess not. We open with some pretty nice art, actually, and a random guy talking about profits rising in clonage, the organ market, and radiation in the colonies. Don't think we'll see any of these things. They just get named. He is part of something called the Holzenbein Estate, which operates out of one of these suspended cities. Where it's been established, they keep little robot girl sex slaves. X is finally hitting on someone who isn't related to him, now that Pereira is out, so I'll have to drop the incest counter. But he does love being beat. Oh. They seem to be tracking base, who I guess wasn't in Patagonia. As they land, they're attacked by a bunch of robots wearing Wily emblems, who claim that they've destroyed property. X does a very tasteful Native American impersonation, while Roll suffers a PTSD flashback. Because remember, this is the same comic that had this. I'm not going to stop bringing it up. A funny little note here, X does an attack while singing Pagode, a Brazilian subgenre of samba music. In the midst of battle, the Holzenbein executives look out and wonder why Wily is apparently sending less powerful robots when he has the Neo Mavericks. Dr. Baldhead explains that it's so he doesn't compromise himself, and points out Nastenka. Wait, are they talking about the main characters or the 
police robots. I think the implication is that Wily is manipulating the heroes into attacking the Holzenbein estate in an attempt to take out the executives without officially betraying them, which is why the police bots attacked them for a made-up reason? That's... surprisingly complex. When Mega Man is cornered, Base reappears to save him. This is the one cool moment he gets for the entire rest of the series. Uh, despite being ripped apart again, Roll rebuilds her body with an obligatory ass shot, but just as the fight is starting to turn around, the Holzenbein estate takes off into the sky on rockets, leaving them to confront Base. They are all mad at him for some reason, including Nastenka, who has never heard of him until today. X grabs him by the collar and, much like the reader, demands answers. Continue? Continue. I have a Patreon and a podcast look at it. Here comes the Daredevil! Daredevil. Game, game over! 